Yay. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me today for what's the sixth Journal Club webinar on COVID-19. So uh, we made some really good progress. We've covered a lot of literature so far, and we've got another fabulous four papers today. Um, I'm very excited that we're going to be joined by our very special guest, Liz Crow, who's a good friend and colleague for a number of years. Uh, I first met Liz at uh, the SMAC conference um, in Australia, I think it was, when, I first, when we first met. Um, so I'll uh, move straight on to that introduction, actually, and uh, tell you about Liz. So Liz is an advanced clinician social worker. I hope I have that title for Liz. And you have particular expertise in loss, grief, communication, well-being. And um, Liz is one of the best speakers that I've actually ever had the pleasure to meet. First time I met her was uh, before, before we met, I was giving a talk in a room adjacent to where Liz was actually talking. And halfway through my own talk, we were the whole audience was completely distracted. I had to stop because the uh, room next door was completely full of laughter. <laughs> And um, it was Liz, and that's what generally, generally the reaction that you, you elicit from your audiences. So very powerful speaker. Welcome, Liz. Thank you very much. They're laughing, but I'm not sure if they're learning anything, Rick. So you know, Rick, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> the best way to learn, Liz, and I think they most certainly are. I learn lots from you all of the time. So how are things in Brisbane at the moment? Look, we're very lucky in Australia. We've um, you know, we've had very minimal impact by COVID and we've had lots of opportunity to prepare. I'm actually just about to swap jobs and go over and be a full-time wellbeing counsellor at one of our big tertiary adult hospitals, just looking after the staff in intensive care and emergency medicine. So um, we're very lucky that we've had lots of time to prepare and hopefully our social distancing um, and our lockdown strategies are going to prevent us from ever going to a full pandemic stage of COVID. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear it's um, settled down a little bit in Australia. Um, so moving on, uh, I'll just do a bit of housekeeping first of all. As usual, if you're watching, uh, joining us live, then please feel free to contribute by asking questions, use the Q&A function. Um, we'll see the questions and we can respond to them in real time. You can also use the chat function um, for anything you like to grab our attention, tell us if the connection's a bit dodgy. I believe mine's not working so great this morning, so I hope it picks up. Um, and um, uh, uh, to, to just have any general chat that you want to as we go through. This is how it's going to work. We're going to have one paper that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. This week, it's a very high profile paper from Ben Goldacre's group called, from a, a, a group or a study called Open Safely. We have linked data from 17 million adult patients. Uh, and then we've got three papers this week on the rapid review with a particular theme of grief, loss and communication. That's going to be the climax of the session. All the papers are posted at sintemlinsblog.org. The uh, address is at the bottom of the screen there. So let's move on to our deep dive. And this week, Charlie Raynard is going to take us through uh, this really interesting paper. Thanks, Rick. Um, so this is a paper from uh, Goldacre's group. Uh, the first officer is Williamson. Um, it's from a collaborative called Open Safely. Um, it is a, a really important paper that has some really interesting findings. Um, because it's so important, I'm uh, going to be relatively critical of it, but I think the core message is sound in it. It's a prognostic factor paper. What they're trying to do is identify likely prognostic factors linked with COVID-19. Um, their primary objective uh, was to look for prognostic factors linked to death. If you want to click to the next slide, Rick. Um, they did this through a retrospective database review. Um, they used a pre-existing primary care record uh, database, which is around a Phoenix partnership called System One. They then cross-linked that uh, with nationally held data records for inpatient mortality and also um, the death registry. Uh, the, they say that System One covers 40% of all GP practices and, oh, sorry, 40% of the population in the UK. Um, they have access to more than 50 million records, but only 24 million were quoted in this paper. Um, but ones that were eligible were 17.4 million uh, to be reviewed. And of that, um, 
there were 5,683 identified COVID deaths. Um, looking at the population, is it representative um, of what we have in the UK as a general? Um, it looks like it was in terms of um, basic demographics. Um, they found uh, in terms of ethnicity, which will become important later, they found that they, in their sample they had 11% non-white ethnicities. That was compared to 14% non-white in the 2011 census. So it's, it's in the ballpark range. Importantly, uh, they had a lot of missing data, which isn't surprising when you're doing such a large retrospective database review. Um, for BMI, they found that they had uh, missing data for 22% of patients. For smoking status, they were, had missing data at 4%. Ethnicity, 26% missing data. Um, and blood pressure, 10%. Do you want to click to the next slide, please, Rick? Uh, in terms of potential uh, risk factors, um, in the literature, there's been lots of things swirling around about what might be a risk factor. So they looked at those ones. That includes um, age, sex, ethnicity, um, comorbidities, deprivation scoring, and they looked at all of those in a model. They used a multivariable Cox uh, proportional hazard model to try and adjust for each factors to see if, for instance, BMI, despite smoking status, had an impact on mortality. Did BMI increase your risk of dying from COVID-19? Um, if we go on to the next slide, which is the results of their analysis, um, this is just a, a snippet of some of the hazard ratios that they publish, and there is a much larger figure in the actual study. But this gives you an idea of the relative risks, the relative hazard ratios um, that were present for each risk factor. Importantly, when you're looking at a risk factor, you have to use one of them as a reference standard. So one of them is always going to be zero. For instance, looking at gender, female versus male, they called female the reference standard. And therefore, the, it's what is the male hazard ratio as compared to that reference standard. And that's important when thinking about the other things. Looking at the uh, hazard ratios in front of us here, you can see that increasing age increases your hazard ratio for the outcome of death. Being male, increases your hazard ratio for COVID-19, from dying from COVID-19. So does increasing obesity. Um, the ethnicity hazard ratios quoted here, quoted here, interestingly, are actually from a different um, multivariate model. So it doesn't look like that in this figure, which is one of the potential criticisms of this paper. Um, but because they had so much missing data, more than a quarter for ethnicity, they decided they actually couldn't include it in their primary analysis. So instead, they built a completely separate model to look at ethnicity, um, which is in contrast to how they ha handled some of the other missing data with BMI and with smoking status. If it wasn't available, they assumed that um, they weren't smokers or they weren't obese, which isn't ideal having a slightly mixed approach for different factors, but is pragmatic. Um, there are other important limitations. This study relies on death certificates and um, which aren't always the most accurate. Um, and retrospective database reviews are renowned for having missing data and a degree of recall bias. Um, they quote various stats on the amount of missing data in the study overall, um, but actually we don't know in the patients who had the primary outcome how much missing data was there. And that is quite important because if all the missing data is in all the patients who passed away, who unfortunately died from COVID-19, then we're going to have a really large blind spot and the model actually will be quite poorly informed. The other problem and limitation of this study is that it only includes system one. It's a non-randomized sample of the population. It only includes patients registered on system one. And of that, there seems to be um, only a select proportion of those patients registered on system one in the study. And why we got down to that smaller sample size isn't clear. There may well be a really good reason, but we don't know what that is. Um, so in conclusion, it's not a perfect study. What's important to note is they only got um, approval from a research ethics committee in early April. So this was 
put together at scale and pace, and that scale and pace is really impressive. Uh, putting this study together in a uh, non-pandemic situation would take years. So actually doing this in just over a month is a really impressive piece of work. It's got some limitations, and that's mainly for me around the missing data. Um, but that being said, because of the scale of it, my impression is that the findings are robust and that these factors, which have been identified as giving an increased risk of death from COVID-19, probably are uh, probably is the real situation. The magnitude of that effect might not be perfect, but the effect is probably real. Thanks, Charlie. So fascinating paper. You've also got a QR code here. Yeah, so that's the QR code. If anyone wants to uh, quickly uh, bring the paper up on their phone, um, you can see that figure which I was describing before, which is only a snippet um, of the different factors. And that figure is a really nice visualization of the um, hazard ratios for the different risk factors. And what seems to be different about this paper to some of the papers we looked at in previous weeks, for example, I think in week one, we looked at the paper by Guan in New England Journal of Medicine, which also looked at factors that might predict worse outcome. But in that paper, we had hospitalized patients with COVID, and then we're looking at the outcome and finding out which factor predicted it. Here, you've actually got the whole general population as your denominator. And within that, you're finding the predictors of COVID-related death. So it's not just the chance of dying if you catch COVID, it's the chances of catching COVID and dying. Mm. Which I think is a more robust methodology. Yeah, in, in a way you need both really, but uh, importantly, uh, the analyses of both cohorts, you know, the, the hospitalized patients with COVID looking at the outcome and this population both based study, uh, they're, they're both telling us the same kind of predictors. If you're older, if you're male, if you're from an ethnic minority group, um, you, you, you're more likely to die of COVID. And importantly, uh, if you're a, an ex-smoker, you don't do particularly well. Uh, but if you're a smoker, <laughs> it's actually protective. So don't give up smoking during the pandemic. Uh, so in their adjusted analysis of that, they thought that some of um, that unusual protective effect might be related to an overlay of chronic lung disease. So what we might be seeing there is a confounding factor that the um, ex-smokers um, have a higher rate of chronic lung disease, and that might be why they stopped, but that it's for chronic lung disease, which might infer more of the risk. Great, I think that answers a question from Jennifer there, and did the author suggest a reason for the seemingly strained results about smoking as a risk factor? Um, Simon, you want to come in? And just a, a simple observation that even in a study like this of 17 million people, because the event rate's actually quite small, because the event rate's quite small still, the confidence intervals are actually still pretty wide, despite having such a large number of people in there. And of course, what they have said is that they will be taking this study forward. And as more people come into it and we get more events and more deaths, we may get more precision and more accurate results. So it's, it's, this is going to be an iterative process through this study methodology, which I think is also pretty, pretty cool, actually. Yeah, so even with 17 million people, you still get wide confidence intervals and, and what 35,000 deaths in the country. And that's all of them, of course, captured here. Mard has asked, which area of the UK had the highest deaths? And is there any explanation why? So in the paper, they don't um, split it down into geographical area. Um, and they haven't commented on that, um, so it's not clear at the moment. Um, the, in terms of uh, geographical effect, they did look at a, a deprivation index with the IMD, which is a national index for general deprivation, and they looked to see um, if that had any impact on um, the risk factors of ethnicity, age, gender, and they found that uh, it was a predictor in, in and of itself, deprivation, but it didn't explain for everything. So ethnicity, the risk factor from that persisted despite um, accounting for deprivation, which is of interest. Um, and the deprivation is linked to a geographical area. They say it's down to about 650 households each and um, level on that scale. So they tried to account for deprivation uh, geographically, but they didn't specifically comment on geographical areas. 
Right. That is quite an important potential confounder, I think, because you see from the, the graphs from uh, that are released by the government that there's a very unequal distribution of COVID across the country. So actually, if you get different demographics in those different areas, the, the, the predictive factor might be whether there's a lot of COVID in your geographical area um, and the, the, therefore a, demo, a particular demographic characteristic might appear to be a predictor, but it's just because there's a high prevalence of people from that demographic in that particular area. Very true. And also the deprivation um, score relies on an accurate postcode. So if a student is registered as living at home, or if you just haven't updated your postcode with your GP practice, then that deprivation uh, index will be off. Great, perhaps uh, before we move on, the, the last issue of this is really captured the imagination of the media is the issue around um, black and minority ethnic populations um, with this one, because it does seem to be a risk factor. And certainly that's uh, been a, a, a big issue for us to think about whether actually this is a very important risk factor, why it might be a risk factor, um, it seems that we possibly can't compare those hazard ratios that you presented across different characteristics here. But what we can see from this is that being from um, a, a BAIN group actually is a risk factor. Um, but what are the implications and how does it help our understanding? So, so it's really uh, tricky to unpick. Um, they have tried to account for deprivation and it was hypothesized that um, the increased risk seen in ethnic minorities was related to inequality. So you could say in this analysis, to a degree, they've tried to account for that. However, um, I'm not sure that this deprivation index can fully account for the inequality in society. And probably there are some unmeasured factors here around inequality, which may well be contributing to that. And um, the other contributing factor, which is being very, uh, quickly investigated now is whether or not there's a genetic element to this. Um, but there's, there are some things against that. Um, for instance, uh, the rates, obviously the rates of disease in Africa at the moment, putting to side the um, problems with surveillance, um, we're not seeing high rates of uh, COVID-19 there. It could be overlapping things. It could be to do with climate. Um, you could you can argue, like I said, surveillance, but some African countries have really good disease surveillance because they deal with infectious disease outbreaks all the time. And um, so there may be lots of overlapping things there, and it's really hard to pick out. But I think what holds true is regardless of the etiology, regardless of the why, it appears that uh, patients who are of black or Asian ethnicity have an increased risk. And um, what we do about that, I'm not sure. But I think if this paper, to me, convincingly proves that that effect is real. Simon. Yeah, I was, I was just looking through the table. It's, it's worth bringing up the whole thing on um, on your phone to have a look at the, the entire um, hazard ratios. Um, they do look, as it's been quoted on Twitter, like a bunch of TIE fighters coming out of the uh, Star Wars. But when you look at that, some of those are quite easy to explain in terms of associated pathologies, so like hematological malignancy or cancer or diabetes, perhaps. But some of them aren't. So things like male sex and um, and um, ethnicity aren't. So I was wondering what Pam and Paul felt about that from a virology perspective. Have you got a feel for why that might be? Uh, of course, coming there up, but um, yeah. So uh, certainly, um, male gender. Uh, there, there are. I'm struggling to remember what the basis of it is, but there's definitely a, a bias towards viral infections. Um, measles, for example, there's a higher incidence in males. Paul, can you remember what the mechanism behind it is? It's. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember what it is, but but the, that's a definite phenomenon um, in terms of viral infections that that males are more. I'll, I'll have a little look and see if I can find out what the reason, remind myself what the reason is. It, it's just that we're more receptive. <laughs> but no, I don't know the science behind it. So that's fantastic. A great discussion on a, on a great paper and um, we should move on. We, we, we touched on the, the very risky topics of uh, uh, BAME populations, sex, uh, distribution um, and hopefully we navigated that one carefully. So let's move on to the next well, the next paper, um, which Anissa is going to take us through um, and it builds on our epidemiology theme this week. 
um, another big data approach, but a very different one and very complementary. So King's College London have set up an app um, that you use on your smartphone to uh, enter your symptoms if you have possible COVID. And they've an analyzed 2.6 million cases from the UK and the US. And Denise is going to take us through this one. Yeah, so the, the name of the paper, Real-Time Tracking of Self-Reported Symptoms to Predict Potential COVID-19, um, does, doesn't necessarily represent all of the data they've actually collected. There's, if you actually look at the tables which are available, there's a lot of data they've actually collected by this app. Um, but they focus specifically on the, 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 the symptoms. So we'll just take you through it. Um, it's a pre-publication in Nature Medicine. Um, and essentially the team have developed a mathematical model um, which has been informed by this data from um, the, the symptom tracker um, to predict the likelihood of having the virus based on the symptoms that you have. It was launched um, in the last week of March in the UK and then in the USA um, within a couple of days. And it was based on self-reporting daily on the presence or absence of symptoms. And the idea is to sort of track the onset and progression of symptoms so you can identify those who are considered most at risk of developing COVID-19 and then think about a, a bit about how it's then spread. Um, now the data, um, as Rick said, looks at um, around 2.6 million app users from both the UK and the USA. And when you look at the data overall, approximately a third um, reported symptoms known to be associated with COVID-19. 2% of these were tested and received a result. And again, this is self-reported. And just over a third of these uh, were tested as positive. So you can see the numbers become a little bit smaller as you go through, but still a sub substantial number of, um, of uh, app users. Now, one of the key findings um, which has come, uh, come to attention, particularly in the media and has now um, influenced the case, de case definitions and case finding, um, is the loss of taste and smell being a potential early warning sign. Um, and they, they recommended it should be included in routine screening. Um, so, you know, tick for them, they've, they've kind of produced it. It's, it it's, it's having its influence already. Um, the... What they did with the reported symptoms, so just to go a little bit further into it, um, is the those who um, had positive lab results, they then worked out which of the symptoms were most commonly associated with a positive result and used this to create a predictive model as to who with certain symptoms is like, likely to test positive. And the model that they came out with um, uses age, BMI, um, anosmia or loss of taste. Um, cough, fatigue, and then they say skipping meals, but essentially loss of appetite, which predicts the likelihood of infection with those symptoms um, at close to 80%. Um, the sensitivity was around 0.65 um, and the specificity was around 0.8, was slightly lower in the UK group and slightly higher in the US, um, the US group. Um, there was a higher positive predictive value in the UK and a higher negative predictive value in the US. So we can think about the reasons that that might be. Um, we won't know the reasons, we think about them. Um, they, they found that the anosmia the, or the loss of taste was the strongest predictor and increased the sensitivity of the model. However, it did reduce its specificity. They did have a little look at the media influence on this. Um, because they, they split, split the results up by time. Um, and what they found was in the US, it didn't make any difference, the fact that the media had been talking about loss of taste and smell. But in the UK, it did seem to. Um, and as time went on, um, this was becoming more and more of a, of a reported symptom. So that may have had an effect um, in the UK population, but not so much in the US population. Again, what that says about the different populations, interesting, but, but can't be sure. And they then applied the model to a further 800,000 or so app users uh, with symptoms who had not been tested. And the prediction suggested that around 17% were likely to have COVID-19. Now, there were issues, and there are always issues with studies like this. And the first thing is it's, it's a self-selecting group that agreed to join in with this, any, this sort of study. Um, we do have a mean age. A median age might have been a little bit better. Um, but imagining you've got to have a phone, you've got to have an app, you've got to download it, you've got to use it. That's going to separate out a certain selection of the population who are not going to engage with this in the first place. There was a really high percentage of female users. And so depending on the... the, the the categories you look at, we're talking 70 to 80 percent. Um, and that's quite important when we interpret the, the generalizability of the results. 
it's self-reported symptoms and there are issues with that. Um, I mean, from experience, the, the detecting anosmia um, for me was an interesting process. My husband was diagnosed first. So I spent the, the following week wondering whether I could taste or smell things and was it going, was it not going? Could I taste this, could I smell that? And then the only day I knew it definitely gone was when I couldn't smell my uh, child's nappy. Um, and you do wonder about the, the you know, when did it start? It's quite hard to be sure. And as it wore off, again, from anecdotal, um, an anecdotal experience, it, it wasn't just that it suddenly came back. So I think things like that have to be uh, taken into consideration in terms of timing. Um, and obviously lab testing is only gonna be carried out in a select number of individuals and they're likely to be the more severe group. So it does make generalization a little bit tricky. And the authors, as I said, do suggest that results might be able to help identify those infected at the earliest demonstration of the symptoms. Um, but in particular, they, they want this anosmia and, 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 and loss of taste to be included um, as a sort of diagnostic uh, factor. And, and as I said, it does seem to have, uh, have taken off fairly well. It's on the news. Yeah, it certainly has. And the anosmia is the key headline on that. Um, do you think as we get through to the coming winter and we mix it in with all of the other seasonal colds and influenza that might come, that it might lose its predictive value. You know, people get a blocked nose, they can't smell the same. Do you think they're then going to worry it's COVID and will start to, it'll start to lose its predictive value? Well, I think that's the difficult, that's the difficult thing about it. And again, I can only go, it's, it's, a, it's a reported symptom and you can only go off description from people from personal experience, it was very different. It was a very different quality of loss of smell um, with COVID-19 than it has been of any other cold I've ever had. It was very different. It was much more absolute. But how do you pull those two things apart? And as you say, once you get a blocked nose, um, you, you can't taste things as well. I, th I think it will become problematic um, in terms of being a predictive factor of actually being specific um, for, for COVID-19. I think possibly the, the mechanisms might be different from sort of the block nose and, and you know, things that you get with a, a cold or flu. Um, I think coronaviruses in general have, have been shown to cause anosmia before and, and the mechanism is supposed to be that it affects the olfactory nerve and, and sort of deadens the nerve for a while um, so, that, so that you actually do get a loss of sensa sensation rather than just it being blocked kind of thing. Maybe, maybe there's a bit of research that needs to be done that we need to have certain um, compounds that you're asked to smell with certain conditions and uh, that we can use a litmus test. I wouldn't recommend necessarily using baby's nappies as a, as a test for that, but there are other things we could use. So I guess when you take the patient's history, that's maybe something we could ask about because the, the anosmia that comes with a blocked nose would be apparent if you go into the detail of it that the patient's got a blocked nose presumably when you couldn't smell your baby's nappy anisa actually <laughs> came without having a blocked nose and was therefore particularly unusual yeah no definitely it was it was highly unusual and very impractical i think there's somewhere with a someone somewhere with a functional mri scanner waiting for the patient with coronavirus and a set of smelling salts somewhere <laughs> that might uh, actually answer the question so we did um, cover in one of the updates a little bit earlier um, in the month, a paper by uh, Beltran and Corbellini et al. that was a, um, a case control study looking at um, smell and taste disorders uh, in coronavirus versus um, other viruses, uh, other respiratory viruses. And they found an increased rate of um, smell and taste disturbances 39.2% versus 12.5% in uh, novel coronavirus, which gave an odd ratio of 4.5 and was found to be statistically significant. So maybe it is a, a little bit specific for the novel coronavirus. Great. We've been joined by uh, Ellie Hollisall as well, um, who uh, you remember joined us last week. So is um, our expert in public health. Uh, Ellie, I, I was fascinated by the method of this paper using an app and um, self-reported symptoms. What, what do you make of this, uh, this study? I think it's really interesting and I, I think app-based um, research is going to be a, a feature of COVID-19 generally, isn't it? Um, uh, interestingly, I had a very similar experience to Anissa and, uh, um, and therefore didn't download this app because I had already, I already knew I had tested positive for COVID and so I, didn't, I thought I would be sort of skewing the data somehow, but I, I think it's been really interesting to see how people have engaged with this huge numbers of, of people downloading it and, and taking part. Um, 
and, and I suspect we'll see the same when the contact tracing app gets used more widely, that, that it'll be that same thing. I guess that the caution that needs to be applied whenever you think about this is that there's a particular section of the population who are using apps, who are willing to download these things. I think you mentioned this already, but um, there's an assumption that because statistically speaking, everyone in the country owns a smartphone, that means everyone in the country owns an iPhone or a smartphone. It's not true. I have three. Therefore, there are a lot of people who have none. And so, you know, we are actually seeing, we see a gradient in access in addition to the ones that we are perhaps conscious of. Um, so they are very useful. They reach large numbers of people who maybe wouldn't have been engaged with any form of, of research or citizen science as we might think of this, but uh, it's definitely not covering everybody. Particularly when we think about the previous paper showing that social mm -hmm. deprivation is associated with poor outcomes and there may be more difficulty with people in lower socioeconomic circumstances to get access to the technology and similar language problems and accessibility and translation, all of those are issues which need to be addressed through these app um, related functions. I was intrigued yesterday when Jonathan Van Tam said adding this symptom into the case definition made very small difference to the case identification. And yet here we've got big difference between those who have had COVID-19, those who have not reporting loss of sense of taste and smell. So it appears from this paper to, to have made quite a large difference. What what you thought of that? Well, so the the, um, the other evidence around anosmia comes from the um, first few hundred symptoms um, work that's been done, where somewhere in the region of 29% of people reported some form of anosmia or loss of appetite. I think the two are very overlapping. Um, but, but for those to happen in isolation from any other symptoms, I suspect is rarer. And I think that's where, where that comes from. The other thing, purely anecdotally, um, being married to a GP, we were talking about this yesterday, and, and they were discussing having added this in as a new symptom. And um, the consensus in the coffee room yesterday was all of them have been using anosmia as, um, as part of their um, heuristics anyway for quite some time. So it might be shifting things in the official numbers, but how much clinical practice is it actually going to change? Perhaps not as much. Where we think it will be useful from a public health point of view is ensuring that healthcare workers get tested and screened at an appropriate time, making sure that they are fast tracked for testing. Yeah. It's a good point. In fact, we've had it in our departmental protocol preceding this publication. We were maybe early adopters on that one, you know, but it was in our case definition. And we should move on to our next. Uh, so now we've got a really relevant paper. We've, I, I really like the fact that we cover papers that aren't just emergency medicine, because it started off for an emergency medicine group here, and we've ended up with a, a really uh, broad coverage of the literature. And here we've got a nice virology paper for Pam and Paul to get the teeth into, but that you'll see is really relevant to what we do every day on the on the shop floor in the, in the emergency department. So up to you, Paul. Oh, yes. <laughs> so we knew before this that inhalation of virus laden droplets, um, close contact with people, not necessarily patients, but people that you meet in the street, uh, you can also pick the virus up from contaminated surfaces. So you, you touch, touch your fingers on, on a surface and then touch your nose or your mouth and transmit the virus. And we've all seen these high speed photographs of people sneezing and coughing and this sort of large droplet spread that sprays out of the mouth and nose when you, when you get that. But beyond that, at the sub-microscopic level, you have aerosolization of these um, fluids as well. So in a sneeze, the aerosol travels further. And because it's light, it stays suspended in the air for longer, giving us greater opportunity to breathe it in. So in this study, they actually looked by air sampling in two different hospitals in Wuhan. One was a normal, modern tertiary referral center where the most severe case, severely affected cases were nursed. And the other was the equivalent of one of our Nightingale hospitals built in a very short space of time in one of the indoor stadia in Wuhan. And they looked, uh, and of course there's slightly different patient type in, the, in, 
in, in them, in that the severely um, affected cases were mainly in intensive care, whereas in the field hospital, they would have been cases who are not so severely ill that they had to go into intensive care, but may, may have been receiving oxygen treatment. So they looked in various areas of this, and they did it by sampling at a height of about 1.5 metres above the, above the floor, round about the, where your nose would be, and they sucked a set amount of air through filters and trapped the virus on gelatine filters. They then took those gelatin filters and actually quantitated the amount of virus that had been trapped. And in that way, we were able to relate the number of virus particles to the volume of air that had been passed through the filter. And they used very accurate um, digital PCR, which is our most accurate way of quantitating virus particles. They didn't actually look at virus infectivity. So you, really, you're just looking at where's the virus it's not actually making judgments about whether the virus within the aerosol is actually viable. They looked at various areas within these two hospitals. And in the modern hospital, they found very low or no levels of virus in the atmosphere. And they explained that in terms of in negative pressure isolation rooms, the virus was being removed efficiently. In intensive care, and in the cardiac care units, there's high airflow. And so again, the virus is being removed efficiently. But they also found the same in the, in the field hospital. And there, the natural ventilation from the very high roof within the, within the um, facility was thought to encourage removal of the virus from the atmosphere. Um, they looked in various places within the, within the uh, two hospitals and they did find levels of, high levels of virus in the intensive care unit, not in the atmosphere, but settled on surfaces. And they had air sampling in corners of the room because obviously the patients and the equipment around the patients restricts what you can do within an intensive care unit. But they did find it settled upon the floor. And, that has implications for cleaning in these areas. Efficient cleanings are clearly important, but obviously very difficult in a modern ITU where you have so much equipment around the patients. Second place where they found high concentration was where you take your PPE off. So you see a patient, and then when you're being taught how to use PPE, one of the things that's emphasized is how you take the PPE off. And this is an elegant example, illustration of why you need to be careful when you're actually taking the PPE off. Because they actually looked at the size of the aerosols that were generated in those areas. And it seems there were fairly large size globular, globules of aerosols, which were landing on the surface of the PPE, which when you took them off were re-aerosolized into smaller fragments and therefore more easily distributed when you took the, the PPE off. So it shows that those lessons that we learn when we were taught how to, the order in which we should take the PPE off are very, very important. It's a practical illustration of that. They even suggested that maybe we should be actually sanitizing the PPE before we take it off, which seems a pretty difficult thing to do. The other thing that I hadn't really thought about before was the floor. The droplets land on the floor, you foot traffic in the floor, re-aerosolizes those and produces the smaller aerosols back into the atmosphere. So clearly the area in which you take your PPE off is, is potentially a high risk area. The other areas that you perhaps didn't think about were your office, the workstation, and also the team room. All of them had aerosolized virus present in the atmosphere. They also looked outside the, the actual medical areas, um, just as when you're going through a hospital and sampled in, in areas within the hospitals and found that wherever there was a pinch point where you're coming close to other people, particularly people from outside, there was again aerosolized virus present in the, in the atmosphere. So even when you're 
outside the, the unit where the patients are, you can pick up the virus if there is foot traffic and, and pinch points throughout the, uh, throughout the hospital areas. Limitations of it are fairly small sample numbers. You're restricted in where you can sample from in these, in these uh, sort of cases because you really don't want to get in the way of care of the patient to try and sample what's actually happening. And of course, the restrictions, particularly in intensive care units, about where you can place the equipment in relation to the equipment that's already there. Um, the other thing is that it didn't measure infectious virus. So we're making an assumption that by detecting viral RNA, we can actually, we are actually mimicking infectious virus and risk of infection. Main lesson to be learned is watch out for toilets. In the field hospital, they had uh, one meter cubicles, which would be brought in as emergency uh, toilet uh, areas. They were not ventilated. And in there, there was quite substantial amounts of virus present in the air. And they thought that that could have come from infected patients' breath, but also maybe may have been generated in in urination and of course in defecation as the virus is released and aerosolized as a result of those two activities. PPE removal, got to be careful about. Cleaning was emphasized. The, the settling of the virus on surfaces was quite significant. And in terms of the two types of hospitals, the, the tertiary referral center versus the stadium type uh, hospital, which is equivalent to our Nightingale hospitals. The Nightingale hospitals really were not much worse than the, the tertiary referral centre in terms of safety and aerosolization of viruses. So I liked it from a virus point of view because of the technology. You like it from the, the, the reassurance it should give you about your working environment. Yeah, reassurance, but also reason they are that. Um, because some really important things to be aware of about aerosolization, where you take your PPE off and in staff areas in particular. But, and they emphasize the importance, as you did, of, of cleaning. Yes. Does, it, does that mean, I mean, when we doff, for example, we routinely take gloves off and then you uh, use an alcohol gel for your hands and then you take your gown off. Um, should we be doing more? Should we be doing, so, should we be doing something to the air? Is there some spray we should be using? Uh, well, in, in, in laboratories with high risk pathogens, we have a, an arrangement where the, we have an ante room and we're taught to take our gloves off and then our, our equipment. And, it, and in fact, when I've been to infectious diseases where they're dealing with potential category four patients, they don't tell you that. They have double gloves and they take one pair of gloves off to doff the, the PPE and then they take the final pair of gloves off. So there are lessons from the infection control team. If you, you remember when you were taught by infection control how to, how to take your PPE off, if you can't remember them now, it's a good time for a refresher, I think, because the lessons are, are there in this paper that we've really got to be thinking that the surface of the PPE that we're, we're using could be contaminated. Of course, typically in the UK, we're using um, non-permeable aprons in front of the PPE, so that actually helps. And I'm not certain that that was available in, in Wuhan. And it may be that there's, they, they, they did not have the, the impermeable apron that we do. Can, can I just add one thing? I thought the toilet thing was very interesting. Um, and I think in an earlier webinar that, that we had, we show or, or we saw that um, there was lots of viral RNA in, in feces, but not necessarily live virus. Um, and, you know, that, that might account for some of that. But, you know, perhaps one thing to sort of emphasise as well is that when you flush a toilet, you know, after you've um, been to the toilet, it creates a huge aerosol. And, and one of the most effective things you can do is to put the lid down uh, before you flush, because then that contains it in the, in the toilet, whereas, you know, many people don't and, and the aerosol goes everywhere when you flush. So. Not just this female obsession with putting the lid down after us gentlemen have been there then. <laughs> I was going to say, I think the uh, point has finally been settled there, hasn't it? Lid down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah. The win for women across the world. 
as well as the implications for our staff, this has implications for how we might educate the general public, I suppose, because the same principles apply to our patients who are going home to self-isolate. Yes. And, and of course, this, this idea that if we start to use face masks for everyone, you have to think that the surface of the face mask may be contaminated and you need to remove it properly and dispose of it properly. If you, if you are going to go down that route where you, everyone is supposed to wear a face mask. Brilliant. Well, that was a really educational paper for me. I'm sure it was for everybody who is, is listening. Uh, and now we're going to come to um, the climax for our special guest here, Liz Crow. You waited so patiently before we bring you in on your special topic. So thanks very much. We're going to uh, a, a change of focus in a way. No more quantitative research at the moment. Here we've got some focus on bereavement, um, loss and communication. So you've got a, a great paper by Selman et al. You're going to take us through, Liz. Yeah, so this paper is really, it's more of a commentary. It's not even a literature review. It's, um, I guess, a group of people from Bristol talking about what they think is important to consider around um, bereavement and grief during the COVID-19. I thought it was really interesting that they started with advanced care planning because um, I've done research in advanced care planning. I'm very proactive around it. However, in the middle of a pandemic, I'm not sure how much advanced care planning you can actually do when you've got volumes of people coming in through the emergency department. I guess if there's one thing um, that, you know, there should be so many learnings for COVID-19 for all of us. Um, and hopefully one of those is that people really should be talking to their loved ones all the time about what their perceptions is about what gives life meaning um, to ensure when anyone has an accident of any age, we know what their values are. And as relatives, we're able to um, make decisions for them that are consistent with these values. Now, I'm not saying there's no place for advanced care planning in COVID, there is, but um, during a pandemic, I think it'd be very hard to try and get um, ACPs on everyone who's coming through the door. When they talked about communication here, um, they definitely spoke about, you know, the importance of being very clear communication and being proactive. Now, one of the things that we know has been very difficult um, during COVID-19 is when people are wearing PPE correctly, it can be extremely difficult to hear what people are saying. And that's staff to staff, never alone staff to patient. And because of our restrictions, a lot of these families are also, you know, not present. So are speaking via phones. So I think it's a real time that the paper doesn't mention this, but it's a time for creativity with regards to our communication, staff to staff as well, staff to patient. But it has to still be sensitive and it has to be proactive. And I think, you know, the earlier we can give families information at any point in health is, is really critical. And we need to do that in a sensitive, compassionate, um, as well as just making sure that we're speaking in a language that people can understand. And I'm saying this over and over again. We have to remember as health practitioners that, you know, nasal cavity, abdomen, um, high flow. These are not common terms for everyone. And so we have to make sure all the time that people are actually understanding what we're saying, particularly when we're talking about end of life communication. Uh, another big problem that they mention in the paper is just the whole depersonalization through PPE. And I think, you know, again, one of the greatest gifts social media has given us during this um, pandemic is people putting great ideas out there that we can all learn from. And one of the things that I thought is fantastic is when you've got full PPE on, people can't see anything about you. They have no opportunity to make a connection um, or to relate to you. So I love this idea that people have been hanging photographs, sticky taping photographs of their faces to their gowns and for patients who are conscious um, to even put a little spiel like, hi, you know, like, hi, I'm Rick. I'm a research person or, you know, whatever, like I've got kids, you know, as a way for people who particularly may be already hard of hearing or disabled or are just frail or terrified of saying, you know, we, there's a human being under here that's not that much different to you. Whereas, you know, PPE can be terrifying at the best of times. I remember when my brother first had, you know, he's a well 35 year old healthy male when he um, got lymphoma. And, you know, the first time they came towards him from PPE, Nelly keeled over because he was just like, what, why is this person dressed like that? 
So it's all very confronting. One of the things I thought the paper missed um, doing was about talking really creatively about how we can communicate with families during COVID-19. And the no visitor thing, they touch on, on the kind of moral distress and um, injury to staff about this. But I actually think that in some ways this will be, have a bigger impact on healthcare professionals than the deaths alone. And that's just people not being able to visit, people not being able to provide comfort, not being able to say, hey, this is my dad or this is my loved wife or would you mind playing classical music or, you know, we know sometimes nothing about patients. And I think, you know, for you, for people who've been completely inundated with patients, the opportunity to do this stuff hasn't been there. So please don't feel guilty about that. But perhaps as people come up with a little bit of um, room to breathe now and to, and to reflect on our practice, if we can have someone who can ring relatives every single day and just give them a brief update, um, certainly I'm going to give a bit of a plug. We did a podcast on the CODA versus COVID uh, with the old smack guys um, talking with Angela Tonge about the ways that you can do that, you know, whether it's Zoom or on Facebook Messenger but being able to show relatives in real time, um, you know, what's happening to their loved one in the bed and for that person to be able to communicate back, you know, for three minutes of our time means everything in the world, particularly if that person goes on to die. When people are dying, we really still encourage mem memories, um, memory making and mementos, which again, I think it's great that they've discussed this. Um, in in the paper, but the practicalities of there are a bit missing and that might have been a word count issue. But I think about being able to say to people, did they have a favourite song? We'll play it when we know this person is, is dying. Um, did they have a favourite radio station? Uh, is there a paragraph from a book that you would like us to read? Or better still, is there a way of virtually bringing the family into the room that they can read it themselves or they can sing if that's what they want to do or share stories um we've encouraged people to send things in when they're having their 10 to 14 days ventilated in icu where there's stories and pictures that we can hang on the wall that don't bring any um risk of infection to the either you know the staff or the families to you know bringing them just so that there's something of comfort when they when people do recover so i think there's a whole range of things that they've covered well in this paper um, and I think, you know, it, it, it acts as a nice framework for people who might be really stuck about what we can do uh, for, for patients um, with COVID-19. Those virtual means of communication, Liz, uh, sound really important. I, I, I find it to operationalise that in the emergency department where there's no infrastructure because we're not used to it. Uh, you mentioned about using uh, FaceTime and uh, um, other means, social media. Um, how, is that something you use in practice? And how do you get around the concerns about, you know, data protection and privacy? Well, you know, I, I don't think we can completely just, you know, get around that. But again, I don't know how many people are trying to tap into what, you know, someone ventilated on a, on a bed. Um, and I think the benefits versus risk, you know, that we can talk about risk, the risk for COVID for staff around moral injury, the risk for complicated grief for families, I think it, you know, far outweighs us trying to do things. And it's tricky because if you've ever tried to use your phone with a plastic glove on, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, one of the ways that they've been doing that in the ICU in the hospital I'm about to go in is that they purchased four iPads prior to the pandemic um, specifically for this, but it can be done with phones and you get someone to set it all up outside the room, double bag it, get it in so that the, it's already ready to go. So there's some time when the family is just seeing all walls and things like that, but it just it, you know, lessens the risk from staff member to staff member and you literally hold it up and the people converse. Now, if the patient is ventilated, what, you, what we recommend doing is if you can find a staff member, and again, you know, in the peak of pandemics, sometimes this simply isn't an option, but as we are moving to different phases, to have one person in your ED or in your ICU or in your ward 
who is designated to make contact um, with family members. And it doesn't need to be a medical person. It can be a nurse. It can be an allied health person um, with a brief summary of like, okay, so today we're, you know, altering, you know, we're turning down the ventilation settings. Uh, we're hoping to wake your loved one up or things are deteriorating. Is there anything that would be important? And to be able to Zoom, FaceTime the families who can't get into the hospital so that they can see, hey, there are people who are genuinely interested in our loved one. And even though we can't be there, they're going to convey our messages. And that's almost as important for the staff as it is actually for the families and the patient. Because, you know, being able to know we've given someone, and I'm doing inverted commas, a good death is so important to us. And, you know, when you've got these huge volumes and you've had to, you know, cut family members off, it feels pretty awful. So to be able to communicate, you know, a nurse or a doctor held your loved one's hand when they died. Uh, we heard that they loved Bing Cosby and we played that loud and proud on the radio and we made sure that your loved one was comfortable and felt no pain and died very peacefully can really make the world of difference to family members who were not able to be there at the time. One way uh, in which it becomes very relevant to us in the emergency problem is uh, for patients who, who die in the department or for patients who come in in cardiac arrest and we can't resuscitate them because our routine experience uh, is that you know, we, we spend time with those relatives afterwards mm -hmm. um, yeah. and build up a bit of a rapport so they could see the human face of the person caring for their relative. You can't do that now in the pandemic. It's, re it's really challenging. I noticed that in the, I think it was in a separate paper that uh, you sent to us by uh, Mayland, which we could link to on the blog. They talked about sending um, uh, condolence notes to the relative, uh, which is not something I've ever thought of doing. Uh, but and, and you know what? It takes nothing. And look, some people are like, oh, we can't. We don't have cards. You know, we don't have condolence cards. To get a piece of paper from out of the photocopier and say hi. My name is Richard Boddy. Uh, I didn't get to meet you, but I met your dad and I just wanted you to know that we really cared about them and we're very sorry for that outcome. And, you know, at some point in the future when this crazy sends, if you ever want to come back and ask what happens, you know, there'll be someone. That could be, well, don't make that promise first of all, if you can't do it, if 40,000 people are going to show up. But I think it makes the world of difference to say someone cared. Someone recognised that this was a human being who was loved and had a backstory and loved the cricket and enjoyed a port on a Saturday night. You know, those sorts of things are important. And again, it doesn't have to be the doctor or nurse to do that. If you have other people that you can use as a resource um, that have the skills and can cope with that to ring to say, I'm terribly sorry, your loved one has died and... The, the people who were around the bed was Richard, Pam, Ellie and Paul and all of us just wanted to say how sorry we were and that people cared and we took a moment to think of you and your family. But that's a three minute phone conversation that could change the course of people's bereavement. And, you know, unless you've literally got thousands of people coming through the door every day, I think most of us could find three minutes post the death to say that to a family member. Well, that's a really lovely message, Liz, and really important. Um, any final comments uh, on that from anybody else on the panel? Simon, I think you want to come in. Uh, just from Liz, one of the things that comes out of here and, and a top topic which is running at the moment is the potential harms towards health workers themselves, future moral injury and PTSD has been proposed as, as, as all at risk. What do you think we can do to mitigate that from happening now, so prevention rather than cure? I think the first thing is it's just breaks my heart that whenever we talk about staff wellbeing, we talk about deficit, burnout, PTSD, moral distress. What about meaning making? What about um, compassion, satisfaction? What about post-traumatic growth? Look, this is going to impact us, whoever we are, healthcare professional or not, because our world has changed. And for some people overseas, and I recognise this has not been the case in Australia, you know, what has happened, the volume of people that they've had to see suffer is enormous. So I think one of the things we need to do is to keep owning our emotions and our experience. You know, to finish a 17 hour shift where you've intubated 20 people or you've done CPR four times and three people died and to say to your other staff members, oh, I'm shattered. 
this has broken my heart. I've never seen anything like this. And I would really encourage the senior members of staff to share that, um, those ethical dilemmas, to share that moral distress, to share that grief, to share it here, but also to share, you know, like what went well and my God, that was carnage, but I am proud to have done it with you guys, you know, to, to build those commonalities. Um, because of course, this is going to go on, you know, for some people, this is going to go on. So we have to find a way of creating space and creating breaks. And I think, you know, one of the things is then don't say to staff, go home and do podcasts and listen to webinars all night. Um, have some time out, watch, you know, parks and recreation, laugh, enjoy your kids, you know, make dodo like the rest of the world apparently is if you're not a healthcare professional. Um, and, and to really recognise that you know, I actually think that in some ways burnout will be at its lowest ever because people are doing what they love and why they came to healthcare. They are inundated, but they're still showing up because bureaucracy is temporarily almost out of the way and people are doing about what it is that they came to do. They're using their skills to the very best of their ability. And that blows me away that people are working, you know, particularly a couple of months ago, you know, 17 hour shifts and coming home and sharing their knowledge on social media, you know, that it has the potential to, to assist thousands and that they are the sorts of things that we also need to savour and talk about. Am I talking fast enough? <laughs> You're doing great, Liz. Now we're out of time, but there's one other question from, the, from the Richard, which I just want to offer to you for a quick answer if that's okay. Was there any mention of a memorial service to be offered to the relatives when the opportunity arrives in the future? Is there any what, sorry, your Wi-Fi did? A mention of a memorial service for the relatives when the opportunity arises in the future. Look, I love the idea of that. I think, you know, hospitals could say we couldn't do anything on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but when we can eventually get together as a group again or we're going to do this online, in the future we're going to say, you know, mark the date on February the 17th, 2021, that if you had someone who died at the Manchester Hospital, we're all going to light a candle and we're going to applaud you for doing the right thing and, and for contributing. Uh, we have Anzac Day every day in Australia to celebrate our fallen soldiers and this year for the first time ever we couldn't do it. And our Prime Minister encouraged everyone to stand on their driveway with a candle and hundreds of thousands of Australians stood on their driveway with a candle. We can all do those sorts of things to mark, you know, they're estimating a million people are grieving in the world already based on COVID-19. And we, once again, have so much more in common as a humanity than ever before, and we need to bond on that. Well, brilliant, positive message, Liz. Thanks so much for sharing it. Fantastic insights. Um, your input. Uh, it brings us to time. Um, we'll finish up just by plugging the Archem Top 5. And Simon, you want to say a few words about next week? Um, only to say, just to, to remind people to share this as widely as you can. Um, currently, this is the, the webinar and the uh, the podcast and the blogs, they're going out to around about 5,000 people. So the impact of the, the General Club, I think, is pretty pretty broad. But please do share it more widely. Please encourage people to come along and have a listen um, to the podcast, have a look at the blog, and, and keep going. We will have a special guest star next week. I just don't know who it is yet. And Charlie, the Arkham Top 5 still going? Yeah, absolutely. So every week uh, we're sending out the top five uh, papers, which is distilled from one and a half thousand papers uh, that we're that the team are being really great and searching through every single week. Um, if you find a paper and you think it's really interesting, then please submit it on our Google form. Uh, the link's over Twitter. And again, we'll put it out uh, just after this on Twitter again. So if you see an interesting paper, send it in and hopefully we'll put it in our update. Thanks. So thank you to everyone who's joined us today, everyone who's listening later, and particular thanks to our amazing panel who make this and teach me so much. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everybody.